few weeks ago, this was a virgin plot, and the idea of an organic container patio is just a dream. Dermot Gavin creates the ultimate patio for gardeners with a conscience. But would you ever use that? Make the most of a small space with a modern take on the vegetable patch. You do feel surrounded by plastic, don't you? It's just right. It is just perfect. Sad <laughs> evening. <laughs> Welcome to my world. Welcome to Planet Patio. A new series continues Monday at 8.30 on BBC Two. Come home to your patio. This is BBC One. so much thank you hello and welcome to through the keyhole the show that goes into more celebrity houses than junk mail as always we borrowed the keys to two fascinating homes belonging to two well-known personalities and with the help of the sainted Lloyd we'll be taking a privileged peep behind closed doors but the question is whose well to try and answer that question we have our panel and what a panel they are. They're like a greyhound race. There's a lot of bunny, plenty of running around in circles, and at the end you wonder if they shouldn't have kept their trap shut. <laughs> a leading name in interior design, our first panelist, is thinking about bringing out her own range of themed wallpapers. There's the Liam Gallagher line, which comes ready pasted. <laughs> The England football range, which has no clear pattern. And the Melinda Messenger range, which is very attractive, but you can't get the bumps out. <laughs> so, will you please welcome the new wallpaper queen, Lin Linda Barker. Thank you very much. <laughs> Such is the po popularity of our next panellist, that between Leeds Station and here, he signed no fewer than 56 autographs. If anybody wants one, they're on a chair over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's TV critic Gary Bushell. <laughs> a talented actress, our third panellist, is struggling to get to grips with computers. She says, until recently, I thought PC World was our local policeman. <laughs> Will you welcome Catherine Apanovich? <laughs> so what's the game all about then? Well, all our panellists, and indeed you at home, have to do is to peruse the clues and choose whose homes they are. So let's join Lloyd right away at house number one. And watch closely, because remember, the clues are there as we go through the keyhole. Well, that is a very low doorway, so I don't think a very tall person lives here, but certainly a hungry person, because the first room you come into is the kitchen, and what a splendid idea that is. Look at this beautiful color. It's like a sort of free-range egg yolk. It gives you a warm feeling inside, and if the paint's not enough to do that, there's also a picture of Melinda Messenger on the wall for further inspiration. Now, you can tell that whoever lives here is rather keen on travel, and they've brought back, for example, this rather elegant giraffe, presumably from a trip to Africa. There are also lots of signs that a sense of humor is very important around here. There are flying pigs on the wall and amused and amusing vegetables sitting perched on that shelf. I also get the feeling that someone around here is a bit of a footy fan. Just check out the slippers.
The centerpiece of this sitting room is a hippopotamus coffee table. Well, you don't see many of those around. And presumably it reminds whoever lives here about South Africa, a country of which they appear to be pretty fond. Now, the pictures on the walls evoke all sorts of different moods. On the one hand, we've got this very peaceful and pretty canal-side scene of Venice, and then this, an apocalyptic vision of a tornado fighter in flames. You can tell from the books in the bookcase that whoever lives here is rather keen on action and adventure. They like war stories, too, so we've got things like thunder and lightning and the tides of war. Now, there's plenty of military hardware around me. For example, this thing, it's a pitot tube, it's part of an airplane, and it helps them to measure airspeed. We've also got a model of the tornado and one of those beautiful knives that the Gurkhas carry. Perched in the corner by the fireplace, another magnificent piece of military hardware, a commissioned officer's sword. Quite a lot of building work has been going on in this house, and one of the major achievements was converting this loft into a bedroom. It's got fantastic beams and rafters, hasn't it? And I particularly like this very contemporary interpretation of a four-poster bed. Now, let's look at the evidence. Pigs that fly, a useful hippopotamus, a piece of an airplane, who lives in a house like this? David, it's over to you. Well, thank you very much, Lloyd. And now for our home and studio audience, but not for our panel. Here's whose house it is. Yes, it's beautiful, isn't it? Money's been spent there. Very nice home out in the countryside somewhere. It has to be a gentleman, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, we are looking for the gentleman of the house, yes. We are. There is, there is a feminine touch, I must say. The bed is nice, a, yes. A lady wife and two kids, but it, it right. is the gent we want okay. to look Okay. And, and I suspect he's um, been involved in the military, but it's... <laughs> Am I right to suggest that he's he's not involved now? Maybe he's into more of writing and no, maybe yeah, not. Well, he's re he's no, retired he from uh, the forces. Yes, I'm not he has. quite which forces. I'm not sure. He has retired relatively recently from the forces, and he has written about his experiences too. <laughs> Gary. Well, when Lloyd said he was short and hungry, I just had Russell Grant in my head. But obviously, that's wrong. Because when you saw Melinda Messenger, you thought, no, that can't be Russell. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be interested in Melinda. Um, the I mean, th th is the African connection a big part of his life? This is what we... The African connection? Well, you know, the, the hippo, the South Africa links. Clearly not. No, uh, there is a, a foreign connection that is very important, but I don't think one would... May, n may not be there, but it's not, not so much the African connection, I think. And the book he's written but is... But a foreign connection there mm. is. And it's the RAF we're looking at. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine. I have, I have a, a pretty good idea. Um, this chap um, uh, fly, flew tornadoes. Oh, he was part of a, a, a crew of uh, tornadoes, was he? Yeah, he was. He was yeah. Yeah. Not, um, he wasn't actually the pilot, I don't think. This gentleman was the pilot. He was the pilot. Was he involved in the Gulf conflict? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, um, the person I, I, the person was, I was thinking of w was, was not the actual pilot, I don't think. Well, no, the navigator. There were two yes. people who we, the navigator we remember. Right. Yes, yes. The, the yes. navigator was called John Nichol. John Nichol, that's, that's it. it. It's not him. But now, um, what, the pilot... Are these the two guys? Yes, that were shot yeah, down. Shot yes. down and, and he right, was I can see his face now. Okay. Yes, I can, and it will come to me eventually, no. <laughs> with the help of the gods. Um, <laughs> it, well, was, it was one of the pilots that was shot down in the Gulf War. Yeah, those mm. moving TV pictures, mm. you can't forget them. Can they were based John in Nicole. Bahrain, I think. Now, you've done very well getting this fine, Catherine. <laughs> but I don't know whether you... Are you going to make the leap um, to glory? 
Can you think of his name? I can't, I can't, think, I can't, of his I can't name. think This is awful. This is really. Terrible, is it? Isn't it? And, no, Andrew. Not Andy. Not Andy. 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 No, Andy McNabb. No, no someone. Was he, was he, he was in the Essex. Yeah. yeah. Was somebody mm. was. Oh, the name that you're going to kick yourself yes. when I tell you that it is John Peters. Oh, oh that, that was it. John yeah. Peters, John will you Peters. come through the keyhole? <laughs> John, great to have you with us. And, uh, of course, you st after the Gulf War, you stayed on longer than uh, John Nicholl in the... In the RAF, didn't you? Yes, I, I spent another seven years, so that's why you haven't seen me. Um, oh, everyone remembers the phonograph, you know, yes, to sit like this. Course. Yes, yes. But no, I did another seven years. Yes, another seven years, and left as a squadron leader. Or Indeed, yes. Indeed. Now, going back to that experience for a minute, which we've discussed with John, but from your point of view, I mean, one of the worst things about, well, one of the worst things was being shot down or, or missiled down, but... Uh, but in terms of the incarceration, how many days was it for you? Because it was a different length for each of you, wasn't it? I mean, you yes. were released first for some reason. Yes, I was released first, and it was uh, 47 days. And were there, was there mental torture as well as uh, where mock executions and things like that? Oh, yeah, I mean, that, that's difficult. Everyone always concentrates on the violence, but it's, it's more the, you know, hearing other people being tortured, um, you know, mock executions, and, and just expecting all the time you're doing this, you know, yeah. um, because you're expecting them to come in and kill you. But what was the worst part of it? Was the never knowing that, never knowing when they might come to take yeah, you I away? Think, I, th I think the worst part was the television because, um, uh, you know, they, they put the gun against your head and they say, you're never going to see your wife and children again. And that's your, you know, God, I've got to, what do you do? And I, I have a real, you know, people look at that photograph and go, well, wow, but I have a huge sense of failure because of that, that picture. And so that's my worst part. Mm. Were you aware during those 40 odd days or whatever of how John was faring? I mean, or did they keep you both apart? No, we were in solitary. I think the only time we got blown up one night, the whole prison got hit us around, and I shouted, are you, are you still there? And he said, yeah, I'm sitting here with a plastic bowl on my head because <laughs> the, the bombs are coming out. I said, I bet you're not a fat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, because in, so uh, that was the only time that we really knew. Yeah. So what does a squadron leader who's been through these experiences and so on, decide to do with his life when he comes out of the Royal, Royal Air Force? Well, uh, I think what you try and do is, from, from my experience, everyone asks loads of questions, and there are sort of lessons that I've learned, and that's what I'm trying to do now. I've, uh, I've started a, a sort of a business consultancy, bringing in, making people look at how they do, make decisions under stress, you know, their leadership and, and decisions like that, mm -hmm. along with Rory Underwood, uh, the rugby player. You know, oh, so, so that uh, explains, it's UPH, so it's uh, Underwood? Peters and uh, Chapman must mention him, Martin Hedywell, he's, um, he's currently director of the Royal Navy Survival School. So between us, we've, you know, we've got a, a unique combination of experiences that we can really hopefully make people think differently. And that's and what, what we want to do. what sort of people go along to those courses then? Or, or you know... You should come along yeah. to those oh. courses. You'd enjoy it. Yeah. No, um, sort of managers of, of, of businesses, you know, yeah. uh, boards of companies we've okay. done. So. Yeah, because the thing is, obviously, the uh, people who... Uh, want to survive a visit to their bank manager and so on. <laughs> yeah. It's not quite as horrendous as the, uh, as no, the I, experience I, you went through, but, but I guess there are some principles that apply to both. Yes, it's principle. I mean, no, no, I, we, we, we don't play tough. I know we've got a military background and you have had the experience, but it's not that, you know, it's more the ideas of have you thought of these things, because I didn't want the, the experience, but it has, it did make me reflect on a whole number of issues that maybe you really only consider when no. you get older. Mm. And tell me something, did it, did it bring you for weeks, months, or not, sort of nightmares? No, not one. This is not rose-coloured. I haven't had one single nightmare. From the moment I got out, I was fine. You know, and it, it's actually really irritating. Everyone said, oh, are you OK? Look, I went through seven weeks, and don't treat me as if I'm, you know, I was fine the moment I got out. I've never had anything. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, good luck with the new firm. I and here is our good luck token. I wish the Iraqis had given me a key when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To open the door, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Through the keyhole key, which is our way of saying, John Peters, thank you so much. Thank you very much, too. <laughs> John Peters, ladies and gentlemen. John Peters. Well, now, I wonder who's next. Well, let's find out by joining Lloyd right now at house number two, as we go through the keyhole.
Well, whoever lives here is certainly a traditionalist. There's a handsome grandfather clock here in the sitting room and a marvelous proper barometer as well. Although, as it's just leaning against the wall, I guess it shows that perhaps this person isn't terribly interested in the weather. Contradicting that, though, is a magnificent weather vane. Just look at that. I think I've seen it before somewhere, though. Maybe at Lord's. Now, although this person is a traditionalist, they're also someone who's very up to date. So, for example, they've got this fella here, cricketnext.com. So there's certainly a lot of web awareness around here. Now, this handsome coat of arm belongs to the Metropolitan Borough of Barnsley. And we can see that this beautiful case contains the freedom of Barnsley. So whoever lives here is definitely an enthusiastic Barnsley tyke. They're also enthusiastic about collecting goblets, decanters, and rose bowls. This room also shows a passion for cricket, and you can tell that from these two fine figures of the great man himself, Dr. W.G. Grace. Now, whoever lives here is a very keen correspondent. There are lots of letters to be read and answered on the desk here, and I think they're also extraordinarily meticulous about writing and about research because those bookcases are absolutely groaning with reference works, magazines, press clippings, and all matter of research material. Well, it's not quite the rover's return, but it's jolly nice to have a bit of a pub at home. Now, as you look around this room, you can see that whoever lives here is quite a keen traveler. There's a clock on the wall that comes from East Africa. Those bright yellow banners were picked up on a trip to New Zealand. So it's not surprising to find an airline magazine around here. Now, this person really likes ceramics. And there are all sorts of ceramics in this room. There's a commemorative plate, for example, devoted to the centenary test match. There are two ceramic figurines of cricketers and a ceramic of the great ceramicist himself, that is Sir Henry Dalton of Royal Dalton fame. In this room, we can see an interesting